connected with us. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Bart Ewing. He's going to bring your training to you this evening, and I'm really looking forward to hear him talk. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Bart. Um, I'm a supervisor in the Family Preservation Program at DECA. Uh, before I came here, my old job was I was actually, uh, I worked at Cornerstones of Care, and I created a program for uh, teenagers on the autism spectrum. Uh, that were also having problems with some extreme behaviors. And that was a very successful program. And I worked in a variety of capacity at, there for uh, over 20 years. Um, here in uh, family preservation, um, having, uh, autism is still very prevalent as I know a lot of parents are struggling, especially since the pandemic, a lot of services were cut off and it's very difficult to get people to come to the home. And I know a lot of parents are struggling out there. So hopefully uh, this can provide some help. Um, let me be clear, um, autism is a big subject. Uh, there's a lot of little things, uh, crevices and subcategories. And uh, my knowledge is more, tonight's thing is more about uh, behavior and regulation with autism. So it's very specific to that. There's, it'll stray a little bit here and there because it ties into emotions and, and other observations and things. But uh, also I come from a little different perspective, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing it because um, other things are kind of more, are, are more access, but uh, some of the principles that we kind of worked on when I was uh, getting my uh, PhD and, and starting to program Oasis, uh, some of the things were, were kind of a different approach and they were pretty effective, we thought. Um, also, there's, as you know, this the old saying, when you've met one kid with autism, you've met one kid with autism. So this is gonna not cover everything exactly, uh, it is, but that's, feel free to ask questions. If you have questions that are kind of off of what this subject is, I'd be glad to try and point you in the right direction. And when it comes time to recommending you know, resources, um, it can get pretty fine tuned, whether you're talking about girls, whether you're talking about social skills or socialization, whether you're talking about sensory, um, it, it's all pretty specific. So uh, be patient with me there. But tonight we're going to talk about um, just how to how to kind of see the world maybe from the perspective of the child a little bit, which helps us communicate better, and also about how to kind of respond to some of the bit more common behaviors we're going to see. All right, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, and, and, I, and I will get to them um, and they'll be, I'm gonna leave time for some questions at the end. Uh, I did this once before, I had way too much information. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip some slides, but I, uh, I, I can find a way to get the, the, the slide presentation. I can send them to, to somebody who can get them to you if that's request, if you wanna request that. Um, I've actually added more information because I've been to more trains since then. So uh, we're in the weeds here, but I'm going to probably selectively just try and stick to the things I think will be most relevant to you. And I will try not to get too deep into the technical weeds. There's one section where you're going to need to be patient with me because we're going to talk about the brain. And there's a lot of words that I don't know what I'm talking about either, but um, I think it's really significant. So we're going to go there for a little bit. All right, let's get started. Um, Remember one thing about this training, that's the thing to remember. We're dealing with a different neurology uh, and you know, 90, 95% of the world is neurotypical. And the, I know the uh, one in 62, whatever their current number is, about think that their, their brains are a little different. They've got strengths, they've got weaknesses, uh, just like every other brain, but we happen to know some specific things about this brain. So that's, what, that's a very healthy way to look at it. Uh, I'm going to start you off with a tiny video, <laughs> so you got to squint to see it. But um, uh, one of the things I like about this, Shane Quaiscan is, is on the autism spectrum. He's a performance artist. He's a writer. He's a really brilliant guy. He made this video when I was in my Oasis program at uh, Cornerstones. Uh, we had groups, and uh, we talked about autism and education, and, but also about the side issues that impact our kids. And a lot of it is, you know, the genetics and the neurology is, is a big part of it, but also the way they have to deal with the world, especially when they get into junior high, uh, high school, it gets pretty rough out there. Um, so 
one of the things I think that's good is I kind of approach both from the emotional and from the practical point of view. And this is a little video that kind of shows um, some of the, a lot of the issues that impact autism has to do more with their interactions with the world than actually than themselves. So this is, it's a few minutes long, but it's, it's really well made. When I was a kid, I used to think that pork chops and karate chops were the same thing. I thought they were both pork chops. And because my grandmother thought it was cute and because they were my favorite, she let me keep doing it. Not really a big deal. One day, before I realized fat kids are not designed to climb trees, I fell out of a tree and bruised the right side of my body. I didn't want to tell my grandmother about it because I was scared I'd get in trouble for playing somewhere I shouldn't have been. A few days later, the gym teacher noticed the bruise and I got sent to the principal's office. From there, I was sent to another small room with a really nice lady who asked me all kinds of questions about my life at home. I saw no reason to lie. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty good. I told her whenever I'm sad, my grandmother gives me karate chops. This led to a full-scale investigation, and I was removed from the house for three days until they finally decided to ask how I got the bruises. News of this silly little story quickly spread through the school and I earned my first nickname, Pork Chop. To this day, I hate pork chops. I'm not the only kid who grew up this way. Surrounded by people who used to say that rhyme about sticks and stones. As if broken bones hurt more than the names we got called and we got called them all. So we grew up believing no one would ever fall in love with us. That we'd be lonely forever. That we'd never meet someone to make us feel like the sun was something they built for us in their tool shed. So broken heartstrings bled the blues as we tried to empty ourselves so we would feel nothing. Don't tell me that hurts less than a broken bone. That an ingrown life is something the surgeons can cut away. But there's no way for it to metastasize it does. She was eight years old. Our first day of grade three when she got called ugly. We both got moved to the back of class so we would stop getting bombarded by spitballs. But the school halls were a battleground. We found ourselves outnumbered day after wretched day. We used to stay inside for recess because outside was worse. Outside, we'd have to rehearse running away or learn to stay still like statues, giving no clues that we were there in grade five. They tipped a sign at the front of her desk that read, Beware of the dog. To this day, despite a loving husband, she doesn't think she's beautiful because of a birthmark that takes up a little less than half her face. Kids used to say she looks like a wrong answer that someone tried to erase but couldn't quite get the job done. And they'll never understand that she's raising two kids whose definition of beauty begins with the word mom. Because they see her heart before they see her skin. Because she's only ever always been amazing. He was a broken branch grafted onto a different family tree. Adopted. Not because his parents opted for a different destiny. He was three when he became a mixed drink of one part left alone and two parts tragedy. Started therapy in eighth grade, had a personality made up of tests and pills, lived like the uphills were mountains and the downhills were cliffs, four fifths suicidal, a tidal wave of antidepressants and an adolescence of being called pauper. One part because of the pills, 99 parts because of the cruelty. He tried to kill himself in grade 10 when a kid who could still go home to mom and dad had the audacity to tell him, get over it. As if depression is something that can be remedied by any of the contents found in a first aid kit. To this day, he is a stick of TNT lit from both ends. Could describe to in detail the way the sky bends and the moment before it's about to fall. And despite an army of friends who all call him an inspiration, he remains a conversation piece between people who can't understand. Sometimes being drug free has less to do with addiction and more to do with sanity. We weren't the only kids who grew up this way. To this day, kids are still being called names. The classics were, hey, stupid. Hey, spaz. 
Seems like every school has an arsenal of names getting updated every year. And if a kid breaks in a school and no one around chooses to hear, do they make a sound? Or they just background noise from a soundtrack stuck on repeat when people say things like kids can be cruel? Every school was a big top circus tent, and the pecking order went from acrobats to lion tamers, from clowns to carnies. All of these miles ahead of who we were, we were freaks. Lobster clawed boys and bearded ladies. Oddities juggling depression and loneliness, playing solitaire, spilling the bottle, trying to kiss the wounded parts of ourselves and heal. But at night, while the others slept, we kept walking the tightrope. It was practice, and yes, some of us fell. But I want to tell them that all of this is just debris. Left over when we finally decide to smash all the things we thought we used to be. And if you can't see anything beautiful about yourself, get a better mirror. Look a little closer. Stare a little longer. Because there's something inside you that made you keep trying to spike everyone who told you to quit. You built a cast around your broken heart and signed it yourself. You signed it. They were wrong. Because maybe you didn't belong to a group or a clique. Maybe they decided to pick you last for basketball or everything. Maybe you used to bring bruises and broken teeth to show and tell but never told. Because how can you hold your ground if everyone around you wants to bury you beneath it? You have to believe that they were wrong. They have to be wrong. Why else would we still be here? We grew up learning to cheer on the underdog because we see ourselves in them. We stem from a root planted in the belief that we are not what we were called. We are not abandoned cars stalled out and sitting empty on some highway. And if in some way we are, don't worry. We only got out to walk and get gas. We are graduating members from the class of We Made It. Not the faded echoes of voices crying out names will never hurt me. Of course, they did. But our lives will only ever always continue to be a balancing act that has less to do with pain and more to do with beauty. There's a lot going on in that one. And we'll, we'll kind of refer back to it. Um, I could summarize the autism spectrum. You've got these different categories, communication, social interaction, repetitive behaviors. These are kind of DSM type terms. In a summary though, and this is where assessments and things can only go so far, but the autism spectrum is about extremes, about the spectrum. That's literally called the spectrum, right? All these things, you've got hyper versus hypo, the person who does something too much uh, or the person who does things not enough. And so those extremes are where issues become prevalent. Um, so for instance, there's a, there's a common autism assessment that uh, gauges social interaction. It takes the categories on the, on the DSM-3. And one of the, the questions I ask, you know, it's a common issue is, uh, people on a spectrum sometimes can be, quote, loners. Uh, they can like, like to be alone. They don't like social interaction. They like, they don't like, okay, and they don't talk to people. They're uncomfortable in that environment. So they just kind of shut off. And the question is going to bother. So if you fit that, you're going to like score high on that section. But my experience is there is also a type of autism of kids that are way across the other direction. They can't shut up. They are talking to strangers, everybody in the world, they're terrible at it, but they're gonna talk, 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 and they want that acceptance and they're just not very good at it. Those kids are gonna score zeros on that assessment and be seen as, oh, so they're gonna be on like no autism at all. And actually it's about the extremes on either end. And we'll keep going back to that uh, hyper versus hypo. Uh, the three basic, and this is generalizing, because there's a lot more, there's sensory, there's all sorts of things. And all that will come into that. But if you wanted to kind of wrap up the three areas that autism impacts the most, uh, here's communication and language, social skills, and these are broad categories, and what all extreme behavior. And the behavior is what people notice, and the other issues are more what kind of comes into the brain interaction and kind of what leads into that. But those will summarize what those three things are specifically. Uh, communication, you saw a lot of this in the Shane Kwesan video, uh, think about 
the wild, this, his life started on a, cause he couldn't communicate. He was very literal. So he's telling people, my grandmother karate chops me when he's not giving the reference of their nicknames for each other. And this leads to grand problems on a great scale. This happens, I mean, this, I made my living off this where kids get suspended from school. These are the kids who blurt out things when they're nervous. So we're talking about, these are kind of some common interests. Some are more important than others. Pedantic speech, odd or overly bookish tone, like they call it the little professor. That's a little strange compared to the average person, but it's not really a thing. It doesn't really interrupt anything. It's just a little odd. So that would not be overly concerning. Um, the mainly it's it's the ability to interpret what's being said and to assume and to add it and accurately as, interpret uh, whether it's a parent or a teacher and getting the right message and not getting crisscrossed. I would point out, you know, 40% of the autism population roughly is nonverbal, either elective or not elective. Um, appearance versus reality. Things don't add up. And again, when you're talking about two different brains, the neurotypical brain, the autistic brain, we're looking at what doesn't look right. So for instance, autism, their uh, kids are notorious for poor eye contact. Um, one of the reasons that's not them being rude, that is actually is it's actually harder for someone on the autism, for some people on the autism spectrum to concentrate on what's being said if they also have to make eye contact. Um, it kind of, they're so busy focused on the eye contact because they have to do it, that the, the words are just mush coming into your ears. They may be paying attention. They may be looking at their book or the iPad, and you may be just sure that they are not paying attention to anything you're saying. I've been guilty of this myself in groups where I think I played gotcha with a kid and said, hey, you're not paying attention. I heard every word you're saying, Mr. Ewing. Uh, I find that hard to believe. You haven't been paying attention. And he could recite verbatim what I said the last 15 minutes. So be careful what looks wrong may not actually be the reality. So ask questions. Um, kids uh, on the spectrum, oftentimes there is a slow processing speed means, especially when they're anxious or nervous, like for instance, they're getting ready, they know they're in trouble for something, they're not quite sure how it's gonna go. They're going to actually make it difficult for them to translate whatever you're trying to tell them and process that in a normal tone. So they may freeze up, they may not respond accurately. It's again, it's not because they're driving, it's, it's they're simply not getting the information. They need time to process the information. Uh, I generally, when the bigger the issue, um, I give myself, uh, I, I kind of let them know the out, hey, you got suspended from school, we'll deal with it. Here's the range of consequences to expect. But right now, I think you just, we just need to make sure that we're all regulated when we talk. Um, but you know, here's, uh, they always go to the worst case scenario. So you wanna kind of pin that down. And I will talk later about, it. I always try to make their ability to process information and stay regulated actually improves the consequence because that's a bigger skill than whatever dumb thing they just did. Uh, start with the social. Now when we did communication, social is, that's the core of it, social relationships. Uh, difficulty making friendships, difficulty knowing the rules of social engagement, uh, when did how to take turns, when to, what kind of personal questions are off base. Uh, they don't know the social rules, especially the hidden rules, the rules that are, we're just supposed to know. And as we climb the grade school level to the junior high, those rules get more complicated and they change. And that's where a lot of our kids fall off the table. Uh, boundaries are an issue. Some kids, physical and space intruders, emotional, asking two questions, saying blunt things, you know, just not, they just, they're just, they're curious. It's not meant to be uh, mean or angry. They just are generally curious, honest people, and they don't know what the rules are sometimes. Uh, they have a preference with routine, predictability. Change is not a good thing for them usually. Uh, sensory uh, sensitivities. Some kids are very reactive to any sensory slightest noise, uh, certain types of light. Some kids are underreactive. They're the kids that wear shorts and 10 below weather. Uh, they're wearing a coat with three layers of clothing on when it's 95 in the sun, okay? Uh, they, don't, they don't feel the temperature and well, they do, but they don't. Uh, 
And then that over-focus on the special interest, which a lot of times draws people in. Hey, I'm interested in trains. Cool, I like trains. And then they haven't shut up about trains for the next six hours and the friends have drawn in there. They're not so interested anymore. Uh, continual vigilance. Um, when uh, in general populations are out in like school classrooms, the community, people, in the, kids in the autism, but they're very observant of watching what's going on, um, especially for the older kids in junior high stuff. They really want to fit in. That's a natural urge for any kid as they get older. They don't want to look like the weird kid because they already feel like the weird kid. Um, they want to feel connected. They want to feel accepted. They're, so they're going to guess, and sometimes they guess wrong, and sometimes they guess right, but they're going to go with numbers. They're going to guess about what the group thinks is great or what they group thinks, and they're going to try and be that person. So you kind of lose, when you're on the autism spectrum, you kind of lose a sense of who you are very easily, and you become what you hope other people want you to be. That's a huge issue as, as they age. Um, in grade school, those things are still there, but at that age, the, the, uh, the social context, kids are pretty accepting. Kids really don't stress too much about who's different unless you're really making life annoying for people. Uh, if you're just a little odd, that's okay. But as that fear of, and that need for a group identity and clicks, as you get older, it's no kid wants to be the outsider, basically, um, whether you're autistic or whether you're anybody. Um, I work with a lot of times with teens this is kind of where I specialize in. Um, they may need help and they may want help, but they don't want anything that is an alert, what they think is to other kids that something's wrong with you. I had like, when I came as a therapist, they did not want to be pulled from class because none of the other kids are being pulled from class. And they're just, they're doing the domino thinking. They're going to think what's wrong with him? Why does he have to go to the office? You know, so they don't want, they don't even, uh, things that would really help them, special ed, you have to be creative in how to get those services because they just want, they don't want anything to alert them that they may be slightly different than anybody else. And so, although, of course, like everything else I'm going to say, this is not universal for every kid. Um, this is something I came up with. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe I came up with it, or maybe Carla Fisher. She's one of the people I, I use. She have a thing for a link for her on Facebook down the road. Um, having uh, the, the kind of speaking the kids' language. This is a visual, but it's also kids in the spectrum don't respond real well to the long lectures about why they did something wasn't great. Um, so you want to make it easy and you want to make it clear. They don't really care about the why so much and the myth. They just want to know how other people see it. And so when it comes to boundaries, physical boundaries and those, those space invader kids, um, I made it real simple. There's four levels and I could just, we had a shorthand. Uh, comfortable, which means they're socially appropriate. Uncomfortable, mm, they're starting to get a little bit too much, either emotional or clinical. Creepy, I was in the creepy zone a lot with my kids and I had to tell them, just, it got to the point where I just kind of said creepy. And then there's criminal, of course. Criminal, this is the kid who's going through puberty, doesn't know sexual laws or boundaries or, or rules, and decides to ask uh, a girl in the hallway an extremely personal question or touch her body inappropriately out of curiosity. He's, a, he's the kid who some other kid pretending to be his friend says, here, go show this girl and gives him a porn magazine and says, go show this girl this, and he gets suspended as a sex predator, okay? Um, these are the kids who get in the wrong online sites, right? because they don't know how else to learn about something. They're just trying to figure something out. So it can get into uh, some very dangerous areas. And so over time, that became very, the kids appreciated, and they had that picture in their mind that kind of, they, they could kind of it's then set their own scale is between creepy, uncomfortable, and uncomfortable. Okay, got it. Okay, so that was just one of the ways that we guess went shorthand to teach them some basic concepts. Um, extreme behavior, not all autistic kids have extreme behavior. I mean, meltdowns, they have big tantrums. That's what a meltdown is. Um, again, I'm in the business of extreme behavior. That's why kids go into services. It's not because they're autistic. It's because the extreme behavior 
which is a product of other things a lot of times, has become a real problem in those parents' lives. Um, we're talking, so meltdowns can be pretty intense or pretty mild. Uh, so they can be really, it's, it's like big super tantrums. And if you work, if you have an autistic child or if you're working with autistic kid, you know exactly that's part of being autistic. Um, often that's tied to severe anxiety and depression. Um, often it is associated with not just directly, but also indirectly victimization and bullying. Uh, the more stress, anxiety, depression experiences, the more likely then the autistic child is going to have trouble interpreting signals from other people because they're, we're going to get to this in a minute, their radar is always on. The sirens are ready to blare. Their, their brain, uh, those danger signals are extremely sensitive. And we're gonna get into some really cool stuff that's kind of new stuff coming out in just a minute. Um, isolation and loneliness. Um, this is where some of the online stuff come in, trying to reach out, trying to find your first girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, these are the times that can lead people into very bad situations that they don't realize they're in. Um, violating social norms, such as sexual behavior, uh, blurting out violent threats. Um, now we, we're deep, we're way past Columbine, but schools, of course, you don't get to just say crazy stuff like I'm going to blow the school up anymore. Yet, some of our kids, even if they don't have no intention of blowing up a school, they just, that, that it's part of that meltdown, they go to that extreme and they blurt something out, I'm going to kill you all, you know, whatever. And then, of course, they're in trouble for making terroristic threats in the school. And part of that is helping them express their anger and their fear in a more healthy way. But a lot of that is when these things are over for these kids, when after they've cooled down, it's over. They're not gonna go back to their um, thing and, and unless it's gotten really serious. Uh, these aren't real threats. These are just them going, the same kids will, will say the ter extraterrestrials are gonna come through the window and take them away it's the same kind of thing or just it's just something outrageous to help them escape that moment that just shows you how extreme they are uh, it can get into obsessive or compulsive thinking or behavior a lot of that times they're you know if they're playing video games 24 7 if they you know are can't they can't in order to stay calm they have to constantly be connected to a specific thing that's their favorite thing it can become too much and it gets in the way of everyday life I said down the road, there's autistic life, which is that and we need to preserve because it helps, to, it's, it's a regulation device. And there's the real world. They have to learn to live in both worlds. That's the reality. Uh, meltdowns, um, these are the temper tantrums. A lot of parents, you will see this, of course, when it seems like they don't get their way. And it's not to say that autistic kids can't be manipulative or can't try to exploit a situation. They absolutely can, just like anybody else. But sometimes those meltdowns, which don't appear to be easily connected to anything like what's going on, it's not logical. And it, it may be a, uh, something that's built up over time. It could be something that had been holding on from school, but didn't feel safe enough there to express it. And because if you're a parent who they happen to trust and know that you will unconditionally love them, your, your prize is they will be their worst with you because you love them and they can it's better than to take the risk of somebody whose relationship they're not quite sure of. Um, oftentimes, this is tied to a part of the brain, the emotional part of the, brain, the amygdala and things like that. We're gonna talk about polyvagal theory in a minute. Um, it's, 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 it's both a natural part of autism, but it doesn't mean you just accept extreme, you know, property destruction, uh, violence, that, no, it's not the same thing. So it is about, it is about accepting that there's that part of autism is that that part of their brain, which is actually technically larger than the average person's that emotional thing, that they're going to accelerate faster and they're going to get there bigger. And so the goal is not necessarily to say stop having meltdowns. The goal is to both educate on that, have safety plans in place, but also take the intensity of the meltdown and, and take some of that away so it's not so destructive. But the day of them, you know, they're gonna probably stomp off and slam the door still. Better that than breaking out windows and tearing out and putting a, 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 something, breaking the TV. Um, so it, it's, sometimes it builds over time. Sometimes it's, 
And a lot of times they can't tell you exactly what it's about. Sometimes they can. Um, the communication deficits make it hard for them to communicate what's bothering them. Sometimes they falsely assume that you already should know somehow. And, you know, it's been described when they're in that full meltdown as almost like an out-of-body experience where they're watching themselves do it. Uh, some kids have described a red-gray band that kind of crosses their, so there's that over kind of like almost a, the brain is an engine that's been, you know, just a power surge. Um, so the problem, is, it's not a time to talk and under, and lecture, it's a time to uh, use uh, de-escalation strategies and get distance from the triggers. Um, we see the bad behavior. We see the explosiveness. They are feeling also, even though they're kind of being their perpetrators of this and they're out of control, but they are very much aware of their own personal failure in this. There's a, there's a big part of guilt that comes after this. Um, they're assuming also, and it goes back to that faulty uh, communication skills. They're assuming that rejection, that judgment, they're reading our information or our face wrong. They're reading our word, hearing our words wrong. So they're kind of projecting what they think we think onto themselves. And shame is a big part of that. The bigger the explosive meltdown, I guarantee you, the more there is a shame factor in this. Um, there is something that's just, if you, you have to do the dominoes and trace it all back, but eventually it's going to be something that if we could have dealt with it early, it would have saved everybody a lot of time. Uh, Often when they attack the adults and name call and they will use every dirty trick in the book, there are no rules. It just, they just want what they want and they need to get, or they need to get away from it, from the stressor. And uh, it's not so much often that they believe this stuff, but oftentimes also they use that to defend themselves. A good offense is a good defense, so to speak. They're, it's almost like their thinking is, why are you making me feel bad? If the fact that you've raised up uh, you haven't taken the trash out. You haven't cleaned your room. You can't play video games until those are done. Why are you doing this to me? As opposed, they can't see that perspective of they've made their own choices. And it's, yeah, that's part of the process. All right. This is going to be possibly really unpleasant. And it's, it's new. I am not a neuroscientist. I don't even play one on TV. Um, but I was recently at the USA Autism, uh, great uh, online training a few weeks ago. Um, and I mean, it's not new that there is a neurological basis for all these things. But um, uh, there was a presentation by Dr. Stephen Porges on this thing called polyvagal theory. And polyvagal is a, it's a, it's a part of the brain. It's that system we're talking about. It's got a third type of nervous system. Uh, it's where social engagement comes in. Um, and it's basically that alarm system that goes back to caveman days, you know, fight, flight, freeze, the brain evolved over time. And the first part of the brain was this fight, flight, freeze thing. Um, yeah. And a lot of times there's the theory is that a lot of the, uh, this part of the brain for the autistic person has not really gotten to that next level yet. And so that alarm system, that part of the brain, which is already bigger than average, and there's some more that it's also is it's easier to trigger. And then the more things that, it's very similar to kids who are victims of trauma, trauma impacts the, in the same way, the very same parts of the brain, that terrorizing thing, again, enlarges that um, alarm system. So this polyvagal theory, which it's not so much that this is new, I guess they do have more information on it, but it's, it's the, some of the treatments they have, which is really cool. Um, so these nerves, they carry signals between your brain, heart, and digestive system. And as you know, a lot of times in working with autistic kids, the digestive system is all uh, gastro stuff, uh, all those things, oftentimes is an issue with these kids. We've always wondered why are, are these things might be linked for reading. Um, so that it's a key part of that parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, so that's why in, even when you're not autistic, if you have it, vagus nerve damage, it leads to some of these other issues for even for non-autistic people. Uh, so it's epilepsy and depression are also tied in with this. So this is, we're going into, this is a neurological thing here. It's a very, it's not a, uh, so this proposes that in that old nervous system, uh, it, 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 the need for adaptive behavior strategy. In other words, to be safe, 
and my alarm system says there's danger, I'm on a heightened alert and I'm in on it. So they're gonna engage in fight, flight, sometimes freeze, uh, freeze is that old, bit. but fight is when that explosive thing we're talking about, the meltdown. But oftentimes a lot of these kids will take off first, the escape behaviors, right? They can take escape internally and just shut down or get into their special interest, which is used to kind of keep them calm. It's a world that can predict, or they can literally run. Uh, in schools a lot, I deal with kids who are running out of the classrooms and into traffic, things like that. Just, they just want to get away from whenever they see it. I'm going to talk about the Asperger experts down the road. There are these kids who are now men who uh, talk about this a lot in there and, and as they kind of help parents learn about uh, how to help their autistic kids from the point of view of autistic kids. Um, so this whole thing triggers this alarm system. And uh, Dr. Poor just put the word neuroception to it. And it's basically uh, the ability to evaluate risk without conscious awareness. So in a typical brain, um, you have a situation where you hear a noise outside. So if you think about the stoplights, green is safe, yellow is mm, better check it out, red is danger, right? There is no yellow in the autistic brain. It's boom, there's a noise, oh, alert, 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 what's going on? You know, they're not gonna check it out. Um, and so the reactive is the uniquely, so they, it's, it's a matter of safety and it's that fight, flight, flees response. Um, so they, they process the appearance of the threat. Um, Temple Grandin, who you, most of you probably are know, know very well, she was at a presentation of Dr. Porges and when she got this information, her assessment was, you know, this was really like, oh my God. So I'm oftentimes thinking there's a lion in the room and I'm freaking out because I'm in danger because of the lion in the room, but there is no lion. Yet, I don't know there's not a lion. How do I, you know, so, so that's kind of it. It's, you know, you're assuming something that is not correct. That's in a smaller scale. Uh, picture that a teacher who want, a student is, you know, one of those kids who's raising their hands all the time because they want to have questions about everything. And the teacher simply kind of raises her hand and says, give me a minute. I got to help this. Person. And that person interprets that as, oh, she hates me. She's always helping somebody else. He, he takes that a long way than another direction. It's the same smaller air of you didn't read the message correctly. In the most extreme cases, it's actual danger. It's the lion that when there is no lion, I can't, uh, I can't convince that person there's no lion. I, can, I have to slow that person. I have to help that brain. We have to calm the brain down. So the brain tells the kid or the adult or whoever it is, there is no lion. You're safe. I, as a, uh, I cannot, as a teacher or a therapist, say, there's no lion. It's not, that, that's not going to calm the brain down. You just can't see it. No, there's a lion. There's a lion. So it's all about what can calm that kid down and what are the strategies. And this is going to kind of surprise you what they're coming up with. Faulty neuroception is what the issue is. So you have this distorted social awareness. Uh, you're displacing that into some type of behavior or defensive reaction. And it's, this is one of the things, it's, yeah, people with trauma also do this. There are other conditions that do this. All right, now, I'm not gonna get into this too deep, but the safe and sound protocol, this is, the, there's a, at the end of this, you'll have a copy, if you expect I send a slide to you, you can contact these people uh, as far as this is a therapy. the therapy. The answer isn't therapy like, talk therapy like, we're gonna talk through your trauma. This is literally about calming the brain and, and clearing that signal out. And I've seen videotapes of kids that are just all over the map and they're not paying attention. And all it is, is you need a set of headphones. All right, put the headphones on. There's an app, you download the app on your phone and it plays, I haven't actually heard the music yet, but it plays kind of this weird funky sound or music, it's kind of musicy, but it's down to the tone and there's certain tones that are calming to the brain and it's kind of deeper sounds. So there's like the human voice, uh, the autistic person oftentimes will shut that out, but they may be super uh, sensitive. This is that hyper versus hypo sound. So the human voice may say, 
Why can't you hear me? Because they're not literally not hearing you, but they can hear this faint little high pitch thing or really look that may drive them crazy. And they have like supersonic hearing, but all this is, they, I've seen they put them in the kids like all over the place and they're looking over they're hyper and they put the things on five, 10 minutes, they're engaged. So this, all this music is doing and these sounds are doing is it's, 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 it's not telling the kid to do anything. It's talking to the brain. And the brain then is going from the red alert, the sirens blaring, roo, roo. nope, everything's good. The sounds help the brain calm down. And so when the brain calms down, the kid calms down. And uh, they're learning more about it, but it's, it's pretty cool. I am not an expert on this. I would love to, <coughs> I'm probably gonna get trained in it. Um, it, it it's, it's by subscription, so I'm not sure. To me, this, every school, it's like 100 and, 80 bucks a month or something, I don't know, which is a lot for most parents. But if I'm a school district and I'm looking at all, I've been in special ed classrooms and they're trying their hardest to figure out, every, I'd, I'd invest in some headphones and 180 bucks if I can calm the classroom down. And if it weren't, they're getting better and figuring it, hopefully, and then probably, there might be ways to get it, um, to get some financial aid on it, but it's very promising. Uh, so this is kind of the, the thinking on it. The, the listing is dependent on the influences. Uh, it, it's, it's just the calmness, the platform, all that stuff. Um, it's just talking to the brain. Uh, there it is. You got a pair of headphones, get the, it's my Unite app. There's a dashboard. You got different things you can play. Um, so I just was kind of blown away by that presentation. So I shoved into mine and tried to explain it to you. Now, same thing. Several years ago, before Dr. Porges, uh, Danny Radel and Hayden Meyers were two teenage kids, which I mean, they're just they're really neat kids. This was many years ago. They're, uh, they're still cooking. This site works. Danny, I think, runs it now. He's a full-blown man. And uh, they came up with this idea. They called themselves the Asperger experts. And they sold themselves as a service for parents or whoever else. Um, and they had this program that kind of break down things like meltdowns and things like this. And uh, this is from their point of view. They're, so they're saying this is exactly, their frustration with nor therapy back then was nobody who thinks like us can really tell us about us. So they were missing some stuff. Some of it was okay, but some of it they didn't get. So why not us? And so they really made a thing of us. So the similar thing to the uh, polyvagal thing is what they said they called defense mode. As you notice, and this is well before time, they don't have a degree in neuroscience either, but they've lived it. So this kind of makes me think Dr. Porges is really onto something because these guys are saying firsthand experience are kind of describing the same thing. When you're in survival mode, your mind is on high alert. That's polyvagal theory. Uh, when you're in survival mode, we can't understand a word you all are saying. It's Charlie Brown's teacher, wah, 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 because it's just noise and we're just, trying to survive. Uh, it feels like they're under attack. They're reactive. They're personalized everything. They're really touchy. They're really hypersensitive. So all this is their version of what it feels like when their brain is, over, is overwhelmed. Uh, sensory input is heightened early in the life of ASD kids. Uh, and it's, every kid's different. Some it's that sensitivity to, to tags or it could be crowds. It could be, you know, We've all got horror stories working in schools when it's fire alarm day and nobody told the, the kid on the autism spectrum. And that's like uh, a full, uh, just, it's, it's bad. Um, it, it's actually physically painful when kids are in that, when they're in that sense where they can't control that, that sensory overload. Um, and so they developed this, the awareness filter as a, as a coping strategy, which means anything to block it out. They just want it to stop. Uh, they're super aware and it's, it's a survival strategy and they just need to get away. And that means screaming at the top of their lungs. That means running away. Or if that means becoming almost comatose, they just want it to stop and they're not quite sure what it is. Um, what can you do when a kid's in defense mode? Uh, you create the physically emotional safe environment, comfort and security. You avoid things that can be viewed as attacking. Like it's not, if a kid's freaking out in public, I know that as a parent, you're freaking out, but yelling, criticizing, touching, 
even calm touch, it's going to get it more of a reaction. So it's more about focusing and we're going to talk, it's low and slow. You're going to talk below that level. You're going to try and slow it down because their speed sped up. Uh, the things you are doing cause in your world, uh, most kids need that firming, loving hug or pat on the back. Not so much for the person on the autism spectrum. It's like needles and pens, right? Just good intentions. We get it, but they can't appreciate that. They're going to, it's a good way to get punched. Uh, have safety plans set up for these moments and safe spots, even if you're outdoors. Uh, where in the house, in the school, there should be designated places to go. And classrooms are often to have these things. If you're outdoors, you can have a general idea of go to that bench up the road and we'll watch from a distance, things like that. Uh, the triggers. When, when kids go into defense mode or have those meltdowns, uh, sensory is often it. It could be noise. It could be they not be able to identify it necessarily. It could be something that's just getting to them. And so are we taking something away? Are we adding something? Uh, sometimes then the meltdown is the ability to control the unpleasant trigger. Um, so there is no control. So you scream when the fire alarm goes off. Desensitization methods, like walking into a dark room from bright sunlight, uh, the, S, the autism brain takes a little while to adjust. So having that's something that they can work on in therapy, perhaps, where they're kind of getting used and slowly getting used to understand it. Once, a, once it's understood, once it's broken down into manageable pieces, uh, kids on the autism spectrum actually are quite good at adapting. It's just getting over that first hurdle and understanding it and getting away from the fear and getting it to where they can actually talk about and making it in those small bites. Uh, second mode, overwhelm, too much stress. Uh, there's a thing Car Carla Fisher on Facebook page, which is also listed, the thing called token theory. Every kid on the autism spectrum starts the day with a certain amount of tokens like Dave and Buster's, right? And different things take more tokens. And you're at Dave and Buster's, those really cool high graphic stuff, they're going to take a lot more tokens than the uh, ski ball game. Okay, so you don't know what it is. It could be the bus ride in, that, 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 that's where the stress is. It could be the fire alarm goes off and you lose all your tokens. Once the tokens are gone, the meltdown is coming. They can have nothing left to give. They may be able to hold on until they get home, but yeah, so that's all it is, is it's like a car engine that's been overheated. All you can do is wait for it to cool off. You change the size of information or the demand. You, you make everything smaller. You give time to decompress. Trying to talk to a person when they're in overwhelm is a pointless task. We said that many times. You let the meltdown run their course as long as it's not too destructive or, or violent. If it's just loud and you kind of guide it towards a safer place and then let it cool down. If that means they're get yelling and saying unpleasant things and they're, they're yelling and saying unpleasant things. And you wait for the lecture when they're calm. The third trigger, this is, <laughs> I love it. It's jerks, school age, bullies. This is what we're talking about. Our kids need a plan of how to handle the kids that don't, that see them as targets, that don't understand who they are. There's always a few kids in every class that do get our kids and they are actually good friends. But our kids wanna be loved by everybody. They can't understand it. And strangely enough, our kids will try to win the bully over. They will bring gifts for the bully. They will give the bully his, you know, his, his PlayStation or his Xbox. They thought, if I can just win this person over, everything's gonna be great. And that never happens. Um, so the thing is, we don't, we're, we don't try to change the jerk. We don't try to change the person who's the bully. We focus on what we can do and what our kids can do. We teach them then how to respond. And that means even scripting responses. And we, that means identifying the people who aren't mean to you, stick with them. We have some kids that want the most popular kids in school to like them because that will lift them up, that they'll be okay. I had a kid I worked with who hung out with the cheerleaders and the star athletes. And only because 
if I'm with them, then maybe then I'm cool too. And that's a kid who's lost complete idea. And sometimes those kids were, you know, they humored him. Other kids, they, at times they didn't. But it was always kind of a setup to where the kid was chasing his own self-esteem through living off somebody else's. And it's, somebody, it's external validation versus internal validation. Our strategy would be, those kids don't get you. They're not, you don't have to win them over. Stick to the kids who do like you. And here's how you respond when they are mean to you. Uh, so during the meltdown, they kind of see just what's in front of them, which is us. They will target certain people more than others because they're safer targets. Oftentimes, mom, sorry, that's going to be you. Uh, they just want the bad feelings to go away. Uh, once they calm, then that's, this is kind of one of the really frustrating experiences working with people on the autism spectrum. When it's over, in their minds, that ship sailed. It's over. They don't want, why, why are we talking about ancient history two hours ago? They, it's like, it's out of their mind. They've moved on. It's like they dump it all, and then they're like clean as a whistle. And you're like left with these haunting memories, and they're like, why do you keep talking about something that happened so long ago? And that can be a really difficult part of the parenting is I can't talk to them during the meltdown because it won't work. I can't talk to them after the meltdown because that's going to trigger them because they're saying, why am I I'm all focused on the, on the past? So that's a, that's a tough spot. It is like that overheated car engine. Uh, my advice is cut off almost all verbal communication during the meltdown. That's you and the, uh, them. Uh, don't respond. If you are giving, keep it very simple choices. Or wor the word breathe. Breathe. Do you want to do this or do you want to do that? And keep it simple. You want to calm down and talk later or whatever. But, but worse comes to worse, you don't know what to say. Say nothing. Um, uh, I, as I told you earlier, I framed the parameters of the worst case scenario. Sometimes that anxiety is about Again, that miscommunication, you're going to do, they're going to kick me out of school forever. Uh, you're going to send me to the hospital. You're going to whatever. Um, and it's not even close to that. And then the way, because they're so worried about the consequence, they end up escalating to the point where they have to go to the hospital or they have the police get called or something like that. And they've actually created the scenario when actually it's a matter of, you know, you, you didn't pick up your room. You, you, you can't do anything until the room's picked up or you're off electronics for two hours. Or, uh, uh, so I like to say, okay, here's the situation. You're anxious. I want you to have time to think about it. Here's the range of consequences for what we're going to do. A lot of it depends on how we talk through this. And it's going to be this and it's going to be, don't give them off the hook. You can give them a consequence. Um, but I would like to give that range. That kind of takes that fear away and helps reduce the anxiety. And uh, People say, well, I, I'm a big believer in rewarding positive processing because with the kids on a spectrum, it is the whole, it's the whole thing. Yeah, there's going to be behaviors, but these kids, it's not about letting kids get away with stuff. It's about rewarding learning the skills of, of, of handling their emotions in a healthier way. That's what's going to get them in huge trouble when they, they get become adults. So there should always be a consequence. But if they learn through experience that it's better when I don't yell, it's better when I don't break stuff, it's better when I don't hit people. You know, those, you know, it's better. The police don't come. Um, we talk about certain populations which are vulnerable with the police. This is one of them. Uh, these kids, they get shot too because they look like they're wild. And they look like they're crazy, and it's the it's the same thing. They don't, and the police don't know them. The uh, the the start of the CIT officer has really been helpful, but these kids are really it's not good if they're in police involved. They're highly at risk. Um, the low and slow method is something I talked about, where you always want to be lower than them physically, verbally, tone wise, and slower than them. I mean, don't take it to exaggerate it, but you don't want to stand over a kid who's melting down. 
you want to try and sit down, be distant from if you need to, to protect yourself. But if they're standing and screaming, I might sit down. If they are, I might kneel. I might just, pull, but I'm going to talk slower so they can have a chance of hearing me. And I'm also not going to use a lot of words. And I'm going to also do it low. Everything's low. Is this going to, think about the last time. You, and I might remind them the positive things they've done. We'll talk about that later too. All right, uh, seven senses. Uh, we talked about the five senses. Actually, when there comes down to seven, there the, that sensing body in space and that movement thing with spinning and all that stuff, that's in play too. There's actually an eighth sense, interoception. That's the ability where it's happening inside one's body. You might be asking kids oftentimes have this need to eat constantly and they can't tell when they're full or they also can't tell when they need to go to the bathroom. Sometimes that's a fixation because they can't give up. They're playing their game. They can't, and they are not getting the signal that, hey, you have to go to the bathroom. And they go to, you ask yourself, how in the world can you just go to the bathroom just sitting there and not do anything? Sometimes it's this. Sometimes it's an overfixation on that other thing. So the awareness of being full when eating. And they'll eat to the point where they throw up, especially if it's their favorite food. Um, you know, where people are locking their, their, their sweets up. Uh, they need to go to the bathroom. Feeling pain in the area of the body, but they don't feel it. They broke their arm. They don't, you don't know about it for 10 hours. Uh, here's a sensory example of feeling discomfort in a large crowd, the impact of the noise level, uh, distracted without realizing what's distracting you. Certain things, again, they're shutting off. That's that freeze thing. Uh, that's emotional regulation. Uh, when I work with kids, that's mainly what I'm focused on. Um, emotional regulation is if they can learn how to be less intense express and learn about their emotion and expand their emotions, but also communicate in a better way and help process information better, then the behavior is going to be better. It's that simple. The behavior comes out of the dysregulation. So for me, it's all about emotional regulation. Uh, the fear of the unknown, anything that elevates anxiety and depression, then we got to start, what are the strategies to take those off the table? We can't get everything, but you can see a lot of it coming. So predict what's going to happen. And, and that's the hard part, but it, you'd be surprised. Anything that's different, a lot of times their favorite things are what's going to be um, th those kind of things. Hey, Bart, we have a couple of questions in the chat. All right. Um, so would chewing on objects, um, including like clothing, be a fixation yeah. or that's picking also at sensory. yourself? That's sensory. That's that regulation thing. It's it's the it's the chewing it's also so i might replace that with something healthier right so instead of chewing your clothes uh there's fidgets and things where they can have something and then you can slowly then train them off that but that's that's a regulation device they're doing it to get grounded anything else uh, the other one was um along the same lines about picking at yourself as well but that that could be, be yeah, that could be also could be that could be more that in that obsessive compulsive stuff where it's and that's again, if it's putting stores and stuff, it's a kind of it could be a form of, you know, a lesser form of like cutting yourself, things like that. But it is about repetitive. It's a repetitive thing and it's probably to ground them. Uh, but if it's starting to leave like sores and scabs and things, you want to replace it and then work with somebody on how to slowly move away from the whole thing. But uh, that would be also could be other things too. It depends on when they're doing it. Um, but it is kind of a, yeah, it's a repetitive behavior that would, that's the example of an extreme behavior that's gotten out of control. It's because it's actually leading to harming themselves. Structure and routine are of course great and important in this. Uh, safe sensory landing spots, visual supports, safety plan for locations, including the car. Never argue with an autistic person in a car. Have a, have a rule saying when it gets to a certain point, anybody can call it, pressing that stop button until we get home. 
car can be a lot of dangerous stuff. I've got, I've got many stories of kids jumping from cars, kids grabbing steering wheels. You don't want that meltdown to happen when you're trapped in a small space. I'm gonna skip past some of this stuff. All right, think like a cow. This is the global point of view. Temple Grandin taught me this. The first time I went to her, she, she told this story. Temple Grandin, you know, she has the movie about her and she's really one of the leading people in the autism community. She's also a college professor and she's worked, with, but she got her start because her special interest was in animals, especially in like things like, um, like the meat packing industry and the, well, the, the, the cattle um, industry where, you know, they slaughter cows. Um, and this is kind of her first real job out of school. She was a brilliant person, but you know, no social skills. And you know, she was kind of a joke and she's a woman and that's very much a man's job and back when she was doing it in the early 60s or whatever it was. And so down in Texas, good luck, right? But uh, she was a very persistent person. So some of her strengths paid off, but think like a cow. She got a job and she said, I can, the cows weren't performing well and they weren't, they were fighting going into this cattle. <laughs> they're fighting going to get slaughtered in the cattle slaughtering plant. Go figure, right? Um, and she said, I can design you a better product that will, that will be, the cows will be more responsive to. And they thought, what, what, you're crazy. And here's how she did it. She went through the entire process that the cow went through. So the cow, whatever the journey went from the corral to the slaughtering plant, she went on that same journey and thought from the point of view of the cow which is genius. So, and because she's sensory, and this is one of the strengths, right? It could be a weakness, could be a strength, but because she is extremely sensitive to things around her and very observant, she picked up on things like what was the ground? Certain rocky things were painful to walk on if there was a path. Maybe there was broken glass or something. If they turn a corner and it's right into the sun, and it's in their eyes, that's gonna disrupt the cow. Um, if there, you know, certain things like she'd found like, if we could have a little water path here, that soothes animals. I mean, she's an expert on dogs too. And so she literally designed this new thing from the cow's point of view. And of course, people were laughing out of the cowboys and stuff until she said, all right, do it. And the cows went in like, yeah, they went to their death. That's the ironic part, but um, it was human. The, the cows loved it. The cows didn't put up any fight. And so when I'm working with a kid, or if you're working with your son or your daughter, and it's driving you crazy and you don't understand what is going on. When I've been trapped and I have been lost, I go back to this. Think like a cow. I try to go through the experience from the point of view of the kid I'm going through. If it's a kid who, and I've done this many times and it always helps me understand the point of view, which helps me solve the problem with that kid. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's the stranger the behavior, the more logical, the, it's gonna be something, whoa, okay. I've had a kid who was going to the bathroom under his bed um, in treatment. Um, he was literally getting out of bed, pulling his PJs down and peeing under his bed. His room was right next to the bathroom. And his room smelled, as you might imagine, absolutely awful. They tried, you know, incentives and they tried, you know, they, blah, 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 nothing. So I was at a loss. I, I, he was aware, yeah, it smells terrible. And I went, finally, we did a session in his room and I laid down in his bed and I said, okay, you're gonna time me. Uh, he was talking about, we just walked through it. He finally said, all right, I'm sleeping. Oh, so I'm sleeping. oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. I gotta wake up. And so it's like, yeah, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, well, what's going on? He goes, well, I'm, so I'm gonna, and he goes, it's faster, it's faster. And that's the first time we ever got to the heart of the problem. His position was he doesn't like waking up in the middle of the night. It's hard for him to get back to sleep. His goal was to go to the bathroom as quickly as possible so he could get back to sleep. That's it. 
There is no deep trauma. There's this. I have to go to the bathroom. It's unpleasant to wake up. What's the fastest path to getting back to sleep? That's it. So I said, whoa, the bathroom is right next door. I, said, yeah, but I have to get up. I have to go around. I have to open the door. I have to get up. Goes, I can just go. I said, okay. And let's think like a cow. I said, we're going to do an experiment. You're going to time me. I'm going to, because I, I fixed this so I'd win. But that's how you do it. Right? Once I understood the problem, the solution became easy. So he, he was very excited about this. It was a very big deal. So I went, okay, I'm sleeping. I'm waking up. I got to the bathroom. And so I'm going to do what he does. I got out of my bed. I got on my knees. I pull, pretend to pull my, I didn't take my pants off. I just wasn't weird. So I pretended to pull my pants down. And, pee, and I noticed, though, by being his experience, I said, well, this is really uncomfortable. On your knees, it's hard to go to the bathroom. Goes, yeah, that sucks. I go, and you can't get your PJs, right? You can't pull your, you're just kind of, cre so you're going to spill on yourself probably, right? He goes, yeah, I hate that. I go, okay, I'm peeing, I'm peeing. And I'm taking extra time, okay? I'm taking, I'm milking this. And so then I said, okay, how long? He goes, a minute and 10 seconds. I go, wow, you're right. That's really fast. I go, okay, now we're going to try it again. So I go to sleep and um, I get up. And I go to the bath, I race to the bathroom, and he's chasing behind me with the stopwatch. I get in there and I open the bathroom door. To, and I said, okay, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. Of course, I, had, I didn't have to go as much this time. And I put it up, I race back, I jump back into bed. I go, how much? He goes, 46 seconds. He never peed in his bed again. It's ridiculous, but it's always something simple and practical. Their issue is like, this is what I want, end of story. The rest, I, I don't know, I can't tell you. I don't know if that smell, yeah, it's all terrible, but my goal, and that's that tunnel vision, I need to get back to bed fast as possible. And uh, it'll drive you crazy sometimes. So that's thinking like a cow. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move, yeah, I have way too much material, okay. I'm going to get to some, uh, all right, I'm going to get to this one. Uh, Michael Lewis is a well-known author. He's written many bestsellers. And you might know the movie, The Big Short, which is about the Wall Street crash and the home industry. And uh, they made a movie called The Big Short. It's really, uh, but one of the leading characters in that was one of the Wall Street uh, analysts who was actually uh, diagnosed with Asperger's during this thing. And it was uh, his special interest was home mortgages and bank stuff and stuff. So he, he's one of those guys who actually reads the small print on all these things. And when everybody was kind of the housing market was being flooded, he saw that it was going to blow up before anybody else did. And there's no way it could say itself. So he started, we call that's what betting the short is. You bet short that the market's gonna, it's gonna fail, the stock's gonna fail. And he, oh, he, he was a leading analysis. He had all these private companies and they all quit on him because they thought he was, he was losing money. And then of course the, the great, stock market crash came and the housing industry collapsed and he became a billionaire. Uh, but one of the things I loved about this book, and a lot of times the best stuff I learned about autism is not from textbooks or from papers, it's from everyday life and people who live everyday life. Um, but the role of the special interest is, I thought, it, this is in the book, a client's create a safe place, uh, the retreat from a hostile world. It's why the Asperger's feel them so intensively and why they can't control them either. A person with Asperger's has tremendous difficulty integrating themselves into social aspects of society and often feel misunderstood and slotted and lonely as a result. So an intense interest can build up one's ego. The ego reinforcement is very soothing, but the interest encounters a rocky path or failure. So his special interest is soothing when people were happy with him and saying, thanks for making me a lot of money. But it became something negative when they started to panic and didn't trust his instincts and say, you're losing all of our money, you're fired. And so he never did want to do that again because the experience, even though he ended up being a billionaire, the, the, the soothing effects of that or whatever the purpose of his special interest no longer was a pleasant thing for him. And I thought that's a wonderful way of phrasing it that no book I've ever read could capture. Yeah, the goal is not to change behavior, it's to create relationships. How can, it's not how can I change the child's behavior, is what do I need to, to build a different relationship with my child so I can understand you want to go back to bed and you don't have to pee all over your room to do it. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. 
That's as anxiety increases, social skills decrease, basic. That's Carla Fisher's, her kind of visual on emotions. The, the, the normal state of an autistic person is not happiness, it's neutrality, it's unawareness. That's the baseline. There is happiness, there is sadness, then fear and anxiety, or bigger fear and anger and meltdown. So that's kind of a different way. Of looking. But the, the core state where it's all good is neutrality. They have emotions, they express emotions, but neutrality is kind of that calm nerve, all right? I'm going to get to that later. All right, I want to get to these before I ask some questions. It should be a few minutes. Uh, I call these the de-escalation secrets. These are the kind of the specifics for uh, for parents when you're doing it. Um, one is speak to the subtext, not to the literally what's being said. The kid's screaming at you. He's calling you names. He's calling you fat. He's making whatever it is. You're horrible. You're whatever. Um, that's noise. And it's hard because it's personal a lot of times. Try to look past the noise and kind of get to, remember, they project what they think about. A lot of times what they're yelling at you is what they actually feel about themselves. And I slowly picked this up because I worked enough kids who did that. So the focus of the rant is that you're the bad guy, but try to translate that and whatever's, and then and speak to the subtext, what's in their minds. That's what's going to calm them down. I'm sorry people are mean to you. You're a jerk, you're fat, your wife's ugly. Yeah, I'm sorry people are mean to you, that stinks. And it's like, whoa, it's hard to do. But if you can kind of get, to, especially the more you, you know your kid better than anybody. So if you kind of learn what some of those patterns, what those core feeling, internal feelings are, then you can speak to those and just slow and slow, speak to that, that will, that will de-escalate the, the faster. You got to interrupt the domino thinking. When that kid's going off, it's not just because you didn't give them a pop tart. That the way their brain, it's like a their brain is a library of all past things, and it can like a domino can lead to a whole memory of everything else. I've had a kid blow up because he couldn't uh, get seconds at dinner, and after he was done screaming at me, we were talking about his mom committing suicide and so I mean it was became everything so the little thing can domino into the big big things so you got to kind of interrupt that and get and focus and get it focused back on the I have this thing where I do a, a literal a physical thing because I, you know, I try to not talk so much and so one of my core things is keep it small because the domino thinking makes everything bigger 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 I'm going to school up no 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 keep it small I'm mad because the teacher won't pay attention to me. We can either deal with the teacher won't pay attention to you and won't answer your question, or we can deal with blowing the school up. Which one do you think? So try and keep just, and sometimes if they're really mad, I'm just doing this. If he's escalating, I'm doing this. And I'm going, make it small. And if you work with them enough, they know the signal and they, and they get it. Have a mental index card ready to call positive moments. And recently, too, two weeks, one week. So they're going to focus on, ah, I can't do anything right. I'm a loser. I can't. I did it again. I screwed up. I did. I told him I wouldn't do this anymore. And here I am doing it. And it's like, hey, this is the Joey that's always getting in trouble. This is the Joey that hasn't learned anything. Two days ago, you were in the same situation at school. You didn't blow up. You handled it like a smart kid. That's the real you. So which Joey do you want to be? You want to be smart Joey or you want to be the, the Joey that makes the same mistake every time? You've done this before. I've seen you do this. What's stopping you from being that smart Joey? That's a very effective way because I'm trying to expand their mind. They're locked in and that's part of autism, narrow focus. They only see the problem right here. Our job is to make it bigger sometimes and so they have more choices. You can be this guy and you can be the loser who gets everything wrong or remind you, you also are this guy. Remember, you're not just one person. You have different parts of yourself, strengths and weaknesses. I will have visuals in their room that list their and say, this is what you're, when you're doing it right, this is what you're doing and when you're doing it wrong, which one? How's this work out? When you're this guy, how's it work out? When you're this guy, how'd it work out? They'll make, they can internally make that switch. They will, and then they learn to make the choices and realize, oh, 
I can be somebody else. And they start to like themselves again. Uh, it's always business, never personal. Easier said than done. Uh, they are tough. They're tough, man. When they want something or they want, they want that new thing or they want you to get on Amazon and buy where they are brutal and they play. That's all they care about. That's this. I want that. I want that. I, don't mm -hmm. I usually try and point out the fastest way to get this. When you start yelling and screaming, think about it. Does that make me want to buy this on Amazon or does that make me know? You want something, the fastest way to get it is do this. Do you want it in five hours? Do you want it in two weeks? Do you want it in a month? Or do you want it sooner? Easy choice. You got to help them see the choices. Yeah, we've said it before, the time to have the great philosophical and talk about what's, uh, they're, they're being rude to family, whatever, it's not during the meltdown, it's afterwards. And when they cross lines, you should go back and deal with it. When they violate certain things that are just way beyond the line. I'm not saying don't talk about it. I'm saying talk to them when they can hear it. And it's not like they can just flip the switch and do it, but they can make progress. And then the next time it's happening, you can signal them saying, don't do it. Don't cross the line. We, we promised. And they can actually pull back and they can learn this skill over time. Am I going to do that one? I'm not going to do that one. Well, that's good stuff. Again, you can look at some of these on and you get the video too. That was good. So, all right, questions. And feel free to unmute. It looks like we have one in the chat. All right. Um, Dana asks, uh, she has a kiddo that likes to hit himself or others from time to time around other kids in a group setting. What would be the best way to deal with that situation? Well, <laughs> that's not good. Hey, themselves is usually, it's that subtext, right? And you, so that's the, I'm a loser. I can't do anything right, right? I'm a big dummy. I'm looking, everybody's looking at me. Groups are tough. Groups are tough because remember we talked, the first thing we talked about is how do I fit in? I'm not normal. This is their point of view. How do I, I'm failing at being normal. So a lot of that is built up. And even do, I do triage before the group is you talk about when you get frustrated, have some things there. It could be some reminders. It could be little cards. It could be, uh, I have these things that are feeling cards. Maybe I have, yeah. Okay. See these? Color coded. You can make your own. So if they're feeling nervous about something, they can just put the card in the corner of the desk. Okay. And that's a signal that you're doing. Um, have a plan then about now, and if you get the, you kind of get the contract with the child before your group starts. When you're frustrated, I notice you lash out or you lash in. You know, that's when you're about We got, we, that's the first thing we got. We got to learn how to express yourself without hurting yourself or hurting others. And so when you do that, you're not in trouble, but we're going to go into what we call safety protocol. And it, you're not in trouble. And especially if you follow the protocol, you'll be able to get back in sooner. And so that means you simply separate. Visually losing sight of things is very helpful. Um, it's one of the tips is if mom and dad, if you're home and the child is really focused on one of you, I would recommend whoever that focus is to leave and let the other parent step in because just breaking the visual contact will help that child be less escalated because they'll, they'll, they'll visually not be reminded of it. And they can let go faster. So school is like if he goes to a certain, it could be another part of the room where you just kind of sit and there may be a certain thing he does where he does some breathing or he does something where he just does anything to regulate himself. And then you empower, come on back, join us. We want you to be there. Just don't hit yourself or put a word to it. I'm mad. I feel stupid, whatever it is. Um, and kind of come up with a plan like that. 
But part of it is to understand what's driving it and just understand that being in a group environment is going to be much more socially anxious because he's worried about messing up. He's worried about not fitting in. And so it's hard for him or her to just talk about that and say, oh, it's this, it's this, it's that. It's you're going to have to leave him a little bit. But, it's, but it is about helping come up with solutions about uh, how to reinforce. It could be some, again, some visual cues, simple things. You know, the strengths. I talked about those two versions. Yeah, you blurred that. That was kind of stupid when you blurred that thing. And maybe, okay, Other, all, everybody does that. The problem is that you're different is you don't remember the, the good things you did that day. You don't remember when you said something funny and everybody laughed. So just, you know, have those cues about, it could be visual pictures, whatever. This is what it looks like when I'm successful. And these are the things I do when I'm not being respectful of myself. And I'm assuming things. But a lot of that comes down to the individual kid. But I'd say definitely the hitting himself is a sign of that internal stress. I have a question. OK. Um, so I have a kiddo that has memory loss. I mm -hmm. can literally ask her to do something. She will walk up seven stairs to the room and forget what I asked her to do. Yeah. Is that part of autism or is there something else that can be? Uh, well, okay. remember, autism is one part. There's could be, you know, you can have multiple things going on. That's what makes it more complicated. Uh, usually rote memory is oftentimes affected where you kind of remember that again, they can remember the, uh, that can be a strength where they can tell you in 1871, what the date was when, um, you know, John Wilkes Booth died or something or just, or ate a ham sandwich. But part of that may be focus and just, you kind of, and so that would be something for a, probably a doctor to also address, but yeah, it wouldn't be uncommon. Um, and is it consistent or is it in contact? In other words, How's their memory when they're doing something they value? I'm not saying that she's manipulative and that she's deliberately. I'm saying it's just part of it is the more you're valuing something, you know, during a video game, can she remember certain things if she's playing or if she does something when she's with a friend? But she also could be about just distraction. Her mind may wander when she's done, so it's doing that. So with her, you're gonna you're gonna break things down to smaller steps. So I wouldn't give her go upstairs get your dress, uh, get your, it's be one thing. And, um, and even then she might have some memory issues, but I guess I would want to do more investigate about, is it just consistently where she just may have a really poor short-term memory where it could be, she's got a distraction problem and she's easily, you know, shiny object, <laughs> or is she even fully engaged. It could be as simple as repeat back to me. Hey, not with a, not an angry, this is just this, you know, your memory kind of bad. <laughs> All right. So I know, I, I know you get distracted. So what did I just say? Okay. I want to make sure you got it. Good job. Catch her when she does it right. And then when she doesn't get it right, oh, I've got, no, almost make it, a, make it a little joke thing. Like, okay. But she's probably frustrated too by it. So, but it could be where her memory is more about focus than it is about, it could be as hardcore. She doesn't remember. She just has a very terrible memory. Um, Things like spelling tests, is that, are those hard for? Yeah. So there may be, that's maybe something you might explore in an IEP evaluation, things like that, where you can get some stuff with her. But I'm guessing part of it at least would be focus. Anything else? There are no other questions than chat. Bless you, Dana. I saw that little sneeze. All right. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll send the PowerPoint to you, Crystal, Does that work? And then whoever wants it can request it. Yeah, that sounds great. If you want to download it as a PDF, we can always get that out. All right. Great.